My name is Sujit Chaudhary. I am counsel for the CCF. Uh, I know it's been a long day, um, so I just have a few questions for you. The uh, Canadian Constitution yes. Foundation. That's for the sorry. record. Thank you, sir. Sorry. Um, so, uh, Ms. Sharat, um, you said in your testimony today that one of your roles is to serve as a secretary to cabinet. That is correct. And, uh, and that in that role, you set or you participate in the setting of agendas for cabinet meetings. You said you determine attendance, and that attendance includes, as we've seen uh, in the cabinet minutes put into evidence, not just cabinet ministers, but many senior officials. I oversee that process. You oversee I don't that process. personally, necessarily arrange every single meeting, every single agenda. I have a team that works with me on these things. But yes, you are correct to say agendas, attendance. The agenda, I would say, just I should um, clarify, in case I wasn't clear, Mr. Chowdhury, that the agendas are proposed to the chair and approved by the chair. So we then issue the agenda of course. to ministers who then arrive with agenda. But un understood. And, and, you, and you attend those meetings yourself as Secretary to the Cabinet. And as you said, you, you have a responsibility to ensure uh, that if Cabinet is to deliberate or make a decision, that it has all the correct information before it. Um, that is correct, sir. And, and you also said that they are, unlike Cabinet committee meetings, uh, you said they're, they're run in a very structured fashion, uh, where the Prime Minister chairs um, and officials speak if they're called upon. That is what I said, sir. Okay. So I'd like to take you to the Cabinet meeting of uh, February 13th. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I take it that given the importance of that meeting, you were essentially involved in setting the agenda. I was advising the Prime Minister on the setting of yeah. the agenda for that extraordinary yeah. Cabinet meeting. It was not a regu regularly scheduled Cabinet meeting. And, uh, and you also then were uh, centrally involved in determining the attendance at that meeting. And, and, and in particular, I, you were involved in ensuring that Commissioner Lucky, Deputy Minister Stewart, and Monsieur Vigneault were at that meeting. Um, I would say that um, given the topic, I would have expected those deputies to be invited to support their, and agency heads, to support their minister. Um, I, I can't, I'm just trying to remember whether I actually looked at the attendance list, but I would have expected, and I, I would have uh, asked that they be in attendance. And so, and the invitation would have come from the Privy Council office, that correct? Is, that is correct. If not from you directly, that certainly by your ministry. I have a team that organizes cabinet meetings. That's correct. And, and so, we've had testimony. Oh, sorry, Excuse did you me want to? Please, please. 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 Oh. Yeah, my colleague, Madame Duran, is just correcting me that because of the fact we were dealing with virtual meetings as opposed to, it's a technicality, but, you know, to be clear, um, important, um, that because we were dealing with a virtual meeting as opposed to an in-person meeting, it is possible that the invitation may have come through a different channel than our normal cabinet papers unit that sends out invitations and organizes meetings. It may have come through a virtual meeting organizer, which we euphemistically refer to as the Maple Leaf. But the, is that, And is the Maple Leaf lodged institutionally in the Privy Council office? For cabinet meetings? I would think so. Uh, I, I believe it's between the Privy Council office and the Prime Minister's okay, office. Okay, fair enough. But at, at the center? Yes, sir. At the center. Okay. And, and so we've had evidence uh, put to us this week, put to the commissioner uh, as follows. Uh, and have you read um, the CSIS interview panel interview summary? I have not had and a chance so, to do. That. Well, with your permission uh, and with the commissioner's position, I, I should say, I'd like to put up on the screen, if, if we could, witness uh, WTS many zeros 60. CSIS. Any, uh, this is the CSIS? Uh, this is the CSIS. It's Mr. Vigneault's test okay. evidence and it's been, it's been referred to many times this week. In the interview summary as Inter opposed to his summary. in camera oh. evidence. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, I take it there's no objection? Yep. Okay. No objection. Okay. okay. Go ahead. So if we could pull it up, please. 
And this is just so it's, it's the public uh, version. Yes, yeah, this is the unclassified un version. Unclassified yeah. version. Yeah. So if you get, just go to page eight. Uh, you could s scroll down uh, to recommendation to cabinet. Okay, let's stop there, please. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. So, 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 just if you could, I'm just going to read this into the record, and if you could read along with me, please. It's, it's Monsieur Vigneault learned that the Emergencies Act referenced the threat definition set out in Section Two of the CSIS Act once the federal government began to seriously consider invoking the EA between February 10th and 13th. He requested that the service prepare a threat assessment on the risks associated with the invocation of the Emergencies Act. He felt an obligation to clearly convey the service's position that there did not exist a threat to the security of Canada as defined in the service's legal mandate. Uh, and then further on, um, in the in the in the bottom paragraph, so the pardon me, yes, the paragraph that begins, Mr. Vigneault discussed. Um, he said he discussed this threat assessment uh, at the IRG on February 13th, and, and then he says the document was also available for distribution for the cabinet meeting, but he does not know if it was distributed by the PCO. So can you please answer? Was this threat assessment distributed to the cabinet, yes or no? I believe I've said earlier that it was. It was. Uh, and, but, and this was the only threat assessment provided to the cabinet or to the prime minister prior to the decision to invoke the Emergencies Act. Can I just take you to the paragraph preceding that, Mr. Chowdhury? Yes. The threat assessment was with respect to the invocation of the Emergency Act legislation. And I believe that I have given testimony already that indicates that the invocation of the Emergency Act, as in many things, is a balancing act between are you acting too early, too late, doing too much, too little, and the threat assessment prepared by the service, which was discussed at the IRG, as Mr. Vigneault indicates, and which was available to ministers was assessing what the risk was of the invocation of the emergency legislation. And the CSIS assessment was that it, there was a risk that the invocation of the uh, Emergency Act risked further inflaming IMVE rhetoric and individuals holding, and you can see the rest of it, holding accelerationist or anti-government views. As we had, we came to see the next day, or am I getting this right? No, I'm gonna stop there. So, so, but Ms. Charette, was the services assessment that required that, that there was no threat to national security, was that shared with the cabinet? That was not the nature of the threat assessment prepared by the service as indicated by Mr. Vigneault in this statement. Well, the threat assessment prepared by the service was that the invocation of emergency legislation risked further inflaming the rhetoric and individuals holding accelerationist or anti-government. If, if, if I may add, yes. what I said earlier is that we knew that CSIS assessment for the purpose of the application of CSIS Act right. was done and that CSIS concluded that for the purpose of their act, the uh, level of threat was not met. And was that view shared with the cabinet? Yes or no? Does I mean, I can, I can say that I knew. I, I think it was shared in previous IRGs, um, but that, that was not news for, for us uh, when but, but uh, we was gave it the actually, advice. But I'm sorry, just a simple question. Was that assessment shared with the cabinet? Yes or no? with the full cabinet as opposed to the- Yes, at uh, the, the February 13th cabinet. meeting, was that assessment shared with the cabinet, yes or no? The fact that CSIS didn't feel that there was a national security, that there was a threat, yes. security of Canada required to invoke the CSIS yes. powers and authorities. Was that shared with the cabinet, yes or no, or do you not know? Um, I'm just testing my memory, sir, to make sure I'm giving you the very best information. I believe that Mr. Vigneault did not speak at the cabinet. I 
I mean, and, and here, as I said, we knew that it was shared in previous IRG, and, you know, some of the cabinet members were not member of the IRG. Um, so I don't know if that element of CSIS was clearly said uh, during full cabinet, but for sure, some minister, a minister, sorry, and the prime minister was aware of that. But, but you're not saying that, that view, you don't know if that view was shared with the full cabinet at its meeting on February 13th. I cannot confirm that. And what I can you, confirm, though, yes. is that the threat, as we defined, both the clerk uh, and myself earlier uh, here this afternoon, in terms of the threat coming from, uh, you know, all elements, the, and I won't go back again, but from transport, uh, GAC, and others, that was discussed. And can I go on to add one thing, which is in the discussion at Cabinet, I'm going to be careful here, in the deliberations at Cabinet in terms of the considerations related to the invoking of the Act, it's fair to say that there was a discussion about uh, the nature of the threat environment, the legal threshold, the tests for invoking, um, and the evidence that the thresholds had been met. But, but you don't know if Mr. Vigneault's assessment was shared with the cabinet. So, so just one thing. Yeah. Minister, uh, Minister, Mr. Vigneault's assessment on the fact that invoking the Emergency Act sure. can inflame the situation, that was shared. And we've heard that also and, from and, provinces. And I'm, not, and I'm not asking you about that. Yeah. I'm asking about what he stated in the previous paragraph of his, of his evidence. Do we know if his views? So I, I think we answer that we cannot confirm that. I, I think I share with the best of my knowledge that I'm sure that some ministers were aware of that, key ministers involved in the management of the convoy, the members of the IRG, that the PM, Prime Minister, sorry, was, uh, was aware, but I cannot confirm whether or not it was discussed. Um, like, you know, that uh, CSIS uh, reports to uh, the public safety minister, what he said, uh, we cannot disclose, and to be honest, I really don't know. So I cannot confirm that. And so have you had a chance to review Deputy Minister Stewart's testimony from this week? Well, I've listened to part of it. To part of it, yeah. So, so, uh, so I'd, I'd put to you that um, under cross-examination this week, Deputy Minister Stewart testified on Monday that CSIS was not asked to provide this assessment to Cabinet. Do you have any reason to disagree with Deputy Minister Stewart's testimony? I believe I said, Mr. Chowdhury, that Mr. Vigneault did not speak at the Cabinet meeting. Thank you. Therefore, he was not, he did not speak, he did not read that into the record himself. So, I, I now would like to turn to um, the memo, Ms. Charette, that you wrote to the Prime Minister. You're going to have to make it very quick. Sure, You're way over time sure, already, and okay. I'm generous, but there are limits. There are limits, I know, Commissioner. Um, so, and in, in the memo in which you recommended to the Prime Minister uh, that the emergency is actually triggered, um, you were aware of Mr. Vigneault's view, but nonetheless, you determined that there was a threat to national security, correct? We can go. Yeah, I'm, ha I'm happy to take you through my logic again, if you'd like. I was aware that Mr. Vigneault felt that there was the threshold for CSIS right. to launch an investigation under the CSIS Act was not met. Good. And, and you relied um, on the National Security and Intelligence Advisor view, who kind of integrated, as she put it in her testimony yesterday, uh, information from across the federal government to arrive at her view that there was a threat to national security under the Emergencies Act. She was one of the advisors that I relied on, sir. She was not the only advisor so, that I relied on. So I, would, so I would like to put this point to you, sir? that in a constitutional democracy, uh, to prevent the abuse of executive powers by an elected government, it is imperative 
that the views of a professional, nonpartisan, and expert security services be front and center. And that they not just be a factor, but they be at the core of whether a government decides to invoke emergency powers. And what you've said today is that you're not sure if Mr. Vigneault's views were before the full cabinet. They weren't set, you, you've distinguished the legal relevance of his views. And, and you're suggesting that what the security sector are, agency says- Are you says coming to about, a question or, or, or making a presentation? Are, are you suggesting that what the CISA says doesn't, isn't at the core of what makes it reasonable to, de to determine if a public order emergency exists? What makes it reasonable? To determine, I, I don't understand what your question is. I, 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 I think that. Uh, yeah, please. I'm sorry if you didn't have the opportunity to, you know, the uh, cross examination that I had uh, with Mr. Miller, but I think that we talked about the difference between who was the decision maker under the Emergency Act versus who is the decision maker under the CSIS Act and the purpose of those two acts uh, were different, and what we were looking at was different. I think that what you said when you talk about um, uh, Madame Thomas is that she was integrated views, but views were coming from Minister of Transport. Views was, were coming from public safety. We've, I mean, I can go on and on, as I, sa as I said uh, before, like we, we saw threats from port of entry. We saw threats in terms of presence of guns. We saw kids, you know, being used as shield. We saw, you know, harassment on, on the streets. Like the threats that we were collecting, we saw impacts on our trades. Like the threat we were assessing in order to determine was not only coming from CSIS. CSIS is a very important thing. And CSIS did or made a decision under the act to determine whether or not they were able to uh, open new investigation. But you will hear from CSIS about the views of the director and you should ask him that question. What was the views of the director in terms of the risk of the convoy, even if he didn't you know, open new investigations? as he had to look at, you know, the situation also. So I think we really have to make a difference here between the role of the director in managing his acts versus the role of the director in terms of the input and the information he can, he can provide to us. Commissioner, I think I'm much, way past my time, so I'll wrap up. Thank you. Yeah.